I'm Fee Dalgetty and I seem to have been on our Farmers Council for too long now. Um, yeah, so we're here till 11.50 and that includes time for questions. No slide on here though, sorry. Um, and we'll give the speaker 10 minutes notice that she's got 10 minutes to go. So it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker Leanne Marsh. Leanne is a strategic marketer with a focus on innovation and consumer insights. She began her career in Toronto after moving to London in 2006, working across healthcare, consumer packaged goods and technology. Leanne is passionate about New Zealand's primary industries and the transformational opportunities available. Her role is to create value for the red meat sector by understanding and turning disruptive shifts into competitive advantage. She'll present sharing our story, how we're building Kiwi pride in the red meat sector. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, it's great to be part of Agri Food Week. Um, and I know you had your choice of two other sessions, so let's hope you made the, the right choice this morning. <laughs> and I don't let you down. Um, so um, as my title says, this is about how we're building Kiwi pride in the red meat sector. Um, this is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, you can tell from my accent, I'm not originally from New Zealand. I am from Canada via London, um, and I ended up working for Fonterra when I arrived. So I learned a lot about the dairy industry, and then four and a half years ago, I joined Beef and Lamb New Zealand. And there was probably a lot of things I had no idea about. And so um, the longer I work in this industry, the more optimistic and more passionate I am about it. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here today sharing some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I'm a fast talker, so Fee, keep me, uh, keep me posted. <laughs> but hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, if you have any as we're going through, feel free to sing out. Um, so three parts to this presentation. The first I'll share a little bit about um, what Kiwis think about our sector um, from our Colmar Brunton tracking research that we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, the second part is we'll just share a little bit around what we're doing now, and then third is around the plan going forward. Um, and one thing I should say before I kick in is that this is a longer term initiative. This isn't sort of a, a quick win. This is about actually how the whole sector comes together and we build a platform that we can all use um, to provide that really big collective voice. I think to date there's been lots of great things, but they probably have been happening um, in a fragmented way. And so we're really trying to bring everyone together. So while it might look on, on one side that this is just about kind of getting messages out to the public, it's actually about getting our whole sector working more collaboratively um, and, and really together and going in the same direction, which um, that's probably where it's been a little bit more um, difficult rather than kind of just knocking off some messages to send out to the public. Um, but it's really, really exciting because everyone is behind this, everyone's passionate, um, and now we're just getting to the point where we can really land on some things that we can go out with. So I'm going to start with a question. Um, what does telling our story mean to you? So interested in the farmers in the audience, um, because obviously at some point this will be quite visible. So um, I'm always curious. Um, I've had Lee, actually. Um, we had a bit of a chat with a number of other farmers a couple of weeks ago. I've had some great suggestions. So I'll just throw that out there. You're probably thinking, oh, God, I wish I hadn't chosen this one. <laughs> I think there's a lot of good work going out in the community, in the farming community, and it's not being told to the consumers. They're not all are seeing as a cow shitting in a stream. They're not seeing the thousands of kilometres of you know area we're putting aside. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think farmers are armed with a really powerful tool, and that's their cell phone. Camera, and there should be a collective body where there's so many amazing images that they see every day that we need to share it with our city folk. Yeah, love that. A lot of the factors that are very important in telling our story we bypass because our mundane of other people is put out. And there's been a very clever campaign run from Acton Pirate Ranch with Lisa um, 
in my own name, of it off the list, I can't remember her name, who came out and had a look at what we're doing. She runs uh, a direct TV campaign in America. Um, and and uh, she identified things that we take totally for granted, but then she reminded us, wow, we need to send photos. She led us all the time, remember photos. We take that totally for granted, and we forget that that's what the people want to see. And that's one of the key points. Yeah, great. Um, and I've heard lots of really great suggestions, as I said. Um, so, Lee, you'll remember there was lots of talk about education and getting into classrooms and helping the next generation understand. I see we've got a, a number sitting at the back, um, so it's great to see. Um, and we talked about influencers, um, more positive stories in the mainstream media. I saw the question that came up there about having more balance, and that's definitely something that we are, are thinking um, really strategically about in terms of what we do there. Um, supermarkets, um, huge opportunity there around packaging. That's been some of the other ideas coming out. And my favorite was the um, the bumper sticker. <laughs> it's basically anybody who's been on holiday recently, um, you know how long we've been sitting in traffic and, and someone had said, well, why wouldn't we, well, we've got a captured audience, just have some information at the back of our car. I thought, brilliant, we need to get that, that now. Um, Okay, so um, I'll just run through quickly some stats from our Colmar Brunton research. Um, we've been tracking uh, Kiwis, Kiwi consumers and the general public um, over the last couple of years. Um, one thing to note, this, these numbers are from our November uh, tracking wave, so we're just about to go into our May um, fieldwork period over the next two weeks. Um, what was top of mind at that time was the unfortunate sinking of Gulf Livestock One. So you'll see quite a few comments talking about the cruelty, um, animal welfare, that type of thing. So that's just something to keep in mind. When those events happen, they definitely um, they pop up in terms of uh, people's awareness. So what you see there is that half of Kiwis agree that we're trustworthy. Um, if you look at those stats, you think, oh gosh, does everyone else not trust us? Um, the good news is that's not the case. Um, if you look at the big chunk of neutrals that are sitting there, about a quarter of the population are sitting on the fence. Um, so there's a lot of people who are open-minded, um, but they just don't have the knowledge um, or the familiarity. And I'm a marketer. Um, there's a stat that often gets thrown around, which is, um, on average, we all see about 5,000 brand messages a day or some sort of advertising or messaging. Um, and so people are inundated with a lot of information. It's really hard to get cut through. Um, and so that is a bit of a challenge. We live and breathe this every day. Um, for other people, it's a bit of a blip um, if they happen to see something. So that is part of our challenge is how do we get the cut through and how do we talk about things that are engaging and relevant um, and meaningful to people. Um, and apparently, another marketing uh, number that we throw around is it takes seven times for someone to see or read or hear something for that message to sink in. So consistency of messaging is really, really key. This is, again, why it's so important to get the whole sector on board with what are our key messages so that we're not going out with 30 different messages from 30 different channels, but we're actually focusing on the things that people want to hear about. Um, the interesting thing here, again, is that you know half of people say they know just a little. Um, more concerning is people, I don't know if they're living under a rock, but um, they really kind of don't know anything about us at all. So um, probably some of my neighbors, maybe. <laughs> maybe my, not my direct neighbors. Um, and poor value perceptions. This definitely has an impact on our sector as well. So um, how people are engaging with our sector on a daily basis is really around the supermarket and what they're, what they're choosing to buy and eat. When they look at that sticker price, um, I mean, I guess if you go into the supermarket, in, in my view, it kind of hasn't changed really since the 80s. Um, you know, it's sort of a sea of packaging. We've got a few more brands, and Melissa Clark Reynolds talked a lot about branding and the future of that. Um, so all people often have to go off of is just the price on the package. There's not really any other information or collateral. So people don't understand the care. They don't understand what it takes to create a quality product. Um, the nutritional benefits, all of those things are really, really key as well to telling uh, our story. Um, and then ethical piece as well, as Melissa talked about. Um, and it's limited knowledge that are informing views. Um, so these are the percentage of people who say that we behave in a responsible and caring way towards the environment. Um, you know, people do recognize in a lot of cases that farmers are doing a lot. Um, they are hearing about the regulation that's coming in, and you know, they really do think that farmers have been very agile um, in terms of having to address some of those um, new regulations. Um, and you know, they think generally we're doing pretty well. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good story, but there's more knowledge and more information that people 
on the one hand, are wanting to know, um, so that presents an opportunity, but on the other hand, is trying to find those, those areas that they want to hear about. It's not necessarily about us telling people what we want them to know, if that makes sense. I often say it's, uh, when I've worked for a number of different companies, we're not marketing to ourselves. Um, and I mean, there's only a slight difference here, but there are poor welfare animal care concerns when it comes to beef. Um, I'll talk a bit about the uh, overseas narrative that is driving that, um, but definitely something to, for us to keep in mind. And as I talked about, uh, this, there's a global narrative um, over the last couple of years that you will all um, be well aware of that has sort of really snowballed. Um, and that is a narrative that basically says red meat is not great for the health of the planet. Um, it uses a lot of water. It's destroying the soil. It's wiping out forests. Um, it's leading to heart disease and other health problems. Um, and it's just plain cruel to animals. Um, so it's really easy for people to think, if I eat less red meat, I can reduce emissions, and it'll be better for my health. So why would I continue to eat red meat? And this is our opportunity here, and this is what we've already started on with Taste Pure Nature. So this is about positioning New Zealand beef and lamb. It's about us talking about our free range, um, how our animals are well cared for, about how we sustainably farm, that it's a quality product that tastes really, really good. <laughs> um, let's not forget that. Um, and it's part of a healthy, sustainable diet. And of course, you know, really important here in New Zealand, um, but also globally as well, is about how it supports communities and local economies. So we want people feeling like beef and lamb is good for me and the planet, and actually I can feel really good about buying this product. So that's kind of the, the sort of thinking that we've got as we're going through. Um, so all that being said, um, the great news is Kiwis are mostly proud of our industry. And I guess that's when they start to think about us on the global stage. Um, so I know having lived in London and spending a lot of time with Kiwis in flat chairs, um, that you know, it's always about, oh, we've got to get some Kiwi lamb and you know, we've got to you know, find the butter and you know, all that sort of pride. And so I think when people sort of get themselves out of their kind of own little bubble and think about what we do globally, Kiwis are proud, and so that's definitely an area of opportunity for us to leverage. So as I mentioned, over the last couple of years, this, there's been this kind of big uh, global narrative around red meat that's quite negative. And to a certain degree, as an industry, we've been quite um, on the back foot, and we've been having to play catch up on a number of things. Um, and so it's really important that we are now moving into that proactive space. So Andrew talked a lot about the environmental research that we're doing to help strengthen our environmental story. So the biodiversity on farms, um, the AUT carbon, sequestra carbon sequestration, um, and we've got an update of our LCA happening as well. And so the, all of that will kind of help us get into a really good position. But now it's about shifting more into that offense and talking more about what's really, really great about what we do and our product, um, as opposed to always being on the back foot and feeling like we have to defend. OK, so I'll just stop there for a second. Are there any questions just on the, the research or how people are thinking about us? Okay, can, great. Can you look at, at consumption in New Zealand, uh, per head consumption of red meat? Um, I think we do have some stats around that. So um, I think it has decreased from, like, say, the 80s and 90s, um, but that's because there's a lot more choice available to kiwis. So before, you know, beef and lamb were kind of the staples and people were eating it a lot more often. Um, now you've got, you know, plethora of choice, and so um, the consumption has, has declined somewhat, yeah. But people, nine in ten people are still eating red meat regularly. Um, people love it. <laughs> so. uh, I guess once a week, I think it is. Yeah. The, the Taste Pure Pure Nature campaign, absolutely brilliant. There's one thing that seems to be missing, and perhaps I've missed it. Is there um, a one recognisable brand which you come say, but look like we had the, Wal the Walmart or something like that? It seems to be this great story to well told, but we need something that can go on the sale of one of our, um, you know, America's Cup yachts to make people go, ah, that is grass-fed beef and lamb. Just a little symbol that we can keep hammering on about. We Have you seen my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you something on that. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, Sorry someone at the back? Sorry, it was just, oh, this is a trust survey. Do you have a reference point so like, is it against doctors or journalists in terms of how do, how do, we, how do farmers compare to doctors or journalists or... 
We actually compare against other primary industries, so against dairy and wine. Um, we also add in tourism and the technology sector, just to give us a bit of a, a, a view around kind of how we sit. And overall, we're actually quite strong um, in terms of overall trust and reputation. Um, and yeah, wine, I think, was... Wine and tourism were quite high, but then with COVID, they've actually dropped back a little bit. So in our sector, um, and one thing to actually mention is that we saw a huge jump um, in support for our sector over COVID, where Kiwis had a chance to sort of think about, you know, what we mean to New Zealand in terms of the economic contribution, as well as our food security. So um, yeah, it's definitely in some ways been a bit of a silver lining for us. Can I just ask a question about um, your research? Have you ever considered asking what the media thinks about what your research is. It's not so much what you say, it's what's heard. And um, as journalists for a few years in this business, um, I wonder whether you've ever been, I don't think I've ever been asked a question about what we think of you. Um, and yet, in many ways, that's the, that's the outlet. We get blamed for all the stuff that's wrong. And I'm just rather curious as to what research has been done and what has been done. I've seen quite a lot over the years, which is quite honestly the key ask of the primary sector has been a little wanting, should I say. Yeah, so is your question, do we spend in, do we, do we ask the question, actually, what media thinks, and in turn... Have, have you asked the media what they perceive? I mean, you've asked, you've got the concern earlier what they think of New Zealand and what they think about, about the industry, but have you asked the media what they think, what their knowledge is? Because I think that's a gap, and um, I know that there's a few of us in the Times publication still don't, they're greater than what's going to do it, they don't, I mean, it's not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it's a good question. I don't know the short answer to that. Um, I do know that there are, there are numerous journalists that we have relationships with and that we've been building relationships with, so that is part of it. But I take your point that actually it's probably an opportunity for us to engage wider and to get that understanding. And again, when we think about telling our story, it is about identifying all the different groups. So the public is just one, um, but it is quite wide ranging. So there definitely media is really, really important. Um, and mainstream media. Yeah, the rural press is always kind, <laughs> but um, I know from mainstream media, um, they're looking for a certain angle. Um, they feel they have the facts, um, and so yeah, it, it can get quite tricky. So yeah, not as tricky as I think. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, a little bit about what we're doing now. So um, many of you will be familiar with the Open Farms Initiative. Um, so fantastic, Beef and Lamb was an early supporter of this initiative, um, and that was partly due to the research we had done uh, through Colmar Brenton. So the research showed that people trust farmers um, more than, say, industry, um, and industry as in, like, industry good, who we often get told, you know, we're the, we're the beef lobby or <laughs> uh, the meat lobby. Um, and actually, uh, they really want to hear from farmers directly. So um, Open Farms is a really great way to open that dialogue. Um, and those also who had recently been on a farm um, were much more likely to have a positive, uh, positive view of agriculture. So that was also another reason why we chose to um, partner. Um, the other thing that we've recently launched is a website called Making Meat Better. I'm not sure if you have seen this yet. Um, if not, uh, I can provide the website um, for you, but easily to find on Facebook or online. Um, other countries have been creating resources like this, which is basically a repository of a lot of the facts and data and information and science. Um, so Australia's got one, for example, and it has multiple uses. So um, we just talked about the media a little bit. So it's now kind of a one-stop shop. So we would often have uh, journalists coming to us and you know wanting to know information. And so this is a really great way that we can keep information up to date um, and everywhere can kind of go in and have a look at the sources, etc. Um, we also recently had uh, a New Zealand Herald reporter um, who often reports on our industry, um, and he recently used the website, and we we anecdotally noticed that it was a lot more um, balanced to what he had um, published. So um, yeah, we felt that that's been quite helpful. Um, and then the third piece, as Andrew mentioned this morning, is around the research we've been doing to strengthen our environmental story. So I talked about updating our LCA, which was last done, the life cycle assessment, um, in 2010. Um, so we'll be publishing that over the next couple months. Um, the carbon sequestration report um, and numerous other things. So um, a big part of the conversations that we're also having is around GWP star for um, anyone who really loves that sort of stuff. Um, and so from a marketer's perspective, I've learned that that's about ensuring that carbon sequestration uh, is um, 
basically able to be recognized um, in, ter in terms of carbon footprinting. So there's a lot of conversations going on there um, and being involved with the global dialogue and global scientists around that. Okay, so um, we're not lacking, lacking facts or evidence, and if you have a look at that Making Meat uh, Better website, you'll see that there's loads of facts on there. Um, and of course, we've got to be really proactive, and we've got to continuously look at the research and you know see where the conversations are moving. Um, but data alone isn't the solution. So it might influence certain people, so NGOs, um, policymakers, journalists, for example. Um, but in terms of the average everyday New Zealander, um, it's probably only going to go so far. So storytelling is really, really important here. Um, and we know storytelling works because um, um, it engages a different part of the brain and it helps people remember. So it makes data stick, um, is what we say. Um, and there's already a great number of farmers, and someone mentioned obviously getting cameras and you know getting videos and farmers you know providing that sort of that stuff. That is really really powerful, and we will want to be encouraging farmers to do more of that. Um, Nikki Berger, if anyone is familiar with Nikki, who's on our farmer council, um, I had the great privilege of doing the AWDT Escalator program with Nikki in 2019, and Nikki runs a blog called Grass Fed in the City, um, and she speaks to an urban audience, and I think she does this really well. Um, she's really raw. She's really truthful. She doesn't sort of hide behind anything. Um, and she connects really well. So again, that's just one example of lots of great stories. Um, and this is what we need to have more of. So the project um, overall, um, not really a fancy kind of name, but we're calling it the Trust and Reputation Project. Um, this is a bit of a roadmap. So the first part is around developing a plan. The second is around how we do it, um, what people will see. Um, and then the third is actually just getting stuck in. So we're kind of coming to the end of part one. Um, as I said, you know, in terms of a project, it would be quite easy just to sort of, you know, pull something together and launch it. But actually, this is about bringing the whole sector together and about everyone having the same messages, the consistency, um, and, and, and now enabling us to have that collective voice. So um, we've been working on this together, which has been um, really excellent. Um, and uh, this gentleman here had his comment around branding. Um, so this is kind of some early thinking that we have, um, but. Many of you, will re who recognizes this kind of logo? Does it look familiar? Anyone who's seen Taste Pure Nature, that's basically the Taste Pure Nature logo. Um, we've always talked about Taste Pure Nature being adapted to local markets. So we've already done this in China. Um, and this is kind of some ideas that we're playing with in New Zealand. If you'll remember from one of the earlier slides that I talked about, it, the pride that generally Kiwis have in our industry is when they sort of come out of their bubble and then think about how we sit on the global stage. So what we're trying to do here is, is talk more around how New Zealand fits within the global scene um, and to celebrate what we do here in New Zealand. And actually, this is the best place to grow beef and lamb. So really trying to build on that New Zealand pride. Um, this is about repositioning the sector. So I would say most people, if you ask them about our industry, they would have a view around who we are, what we do. Um, it's, it's quite out of date, really. Um, and so we almost want them to, to really rethink about what we're doing and how innovative the sector is. And so part of this is around you know, giving people something new um, to think uh, about. Um, again, I talk about that powerful and effective voice as one industry. So this is a platform that everyone can come together on. Um, and it really allows us to be consistent and repeat those messages. So as I said, seven times, <laughs> people have to see something. So not about 40 messages going out on everything we want people to know that we're doing, but actually what are the things that people want to hear about? And then how do we get really, really focused on those messages and so that they see them and hear them um, often? And we tell them through really engaging stories. So we talk about this being a positive platform for the sector to engage public and also to influence government policy. Because our policymakers, we have lots of great conversations. You know, We've got amazing people within Beef and Lamb who go and have those chats. But they're also part of the public, too. So we also see that you know, the messages that we have there, they will see the consistency in terms of the discussions that they have with our people um, and also what we're sharing with the public. Because this is our story, ultimately, at the end of the day. It's not a story for this person and a different story for that person. 
Okay, so the who. So um, obviously this is focused on all New Zealanders, um, but from a marketing perspective, you often have limited amount of resources. Um, you know, how long is a piece of string? You could spend a lot of money doing something like this. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on a group of people that we could get really, really focused on. 50% um, of the New Zealand public is neither an advocate nor a detractor. So we've got 50% of Kiwis who are basically sitting on the fence about our industry. Again, they don't know much about it. And so our opportunity is to shift some of those people to become advocates so that we're not always going out there and doing the talking. We've actually got other people doing that for us. Um, one group that we focused on in particular are environmentally conscious neutrals. They represent about um, a quarter of the New Zealand population. So these people recognize the success of the industry, but they're concerned that we're not doing the right things by the environment. They don't know enough. That's basically the ultimate. Um, they hear something about water, it's bad. They hear something about the environment and climate, bad. They don't know much more than that, but they, they haven't heard anything necessarily to change their minds. Um, and so, again, this is about using our resources in the most effect effective and efficient way. Um, and it's about focusing on people whose opinions we can shift. Because often I get people saying to me, we need to go out there and tell those people, like, that's just garbage. And, you know, like, no, tell them the facts. Those are not necessarily the people who want to hear from us today. So there are a lot of people who are open to hearing from us, and those are the people we want to engage in a conversation with. Um, so that's where we're going to start. Um, obviously, you get a bit of a halo effect. So if you're focusing on one group and doing that really well, other people are seeing, other people are, are noticing. Um, and again, those people hopefully are, are sharing the information with others as well. So um, this target is quite broad, I would say. It ranges from 18 to 59. Um, so it, it does cover everyone. So the other cool thing that we saw is that during COVID, this was the group that shifted into much more of a positive mindset. So we know that you know, they're just looking for that information, the right and relevant information, um, to basically support us. They just want those reasons. Um, this is something that we'll be testing. So the next step for us in this kind of planning stage is to actually speak with these environmentally concerned neutrals and really dig deep into um, where their heads are at and what they're wanting to know. Um, this is where we started with in terms of a framework around some key messages. Um, and again, this is something that we want the whole sector to be across so that, you know, if we're say, sharing these messages, then the processing companies are also sharing these messages and farmers are sharing these messages. So that's where it'll become really effective. So we're talking a bit about that free range grass fed um, and likely it'll be something around antibiotic and hormones. Um, really interesting. Um, I think it's something like nine and 10 Kiwis. This was something they were really um, interested in, and they just weren't sure if this was something they were doing. So some people believe that this is actually how we raise our animals. Obviously, that's coming from an overseas um, narrative. And again, people are kind of going, I don't think we do, but I actually, I haven't seen anything. It's not on the packaging, because we don't talk about antibiotics and hormones on the packaging like they do in the US, because we just go, we don't use them to help raise our animals. Um, so, you know, that seems really obvious to us. So someone talked about, you know, our mundane is pretty profound to other people. So we've just taken it for granted. Um, the second is around sustainable nutrition. There's a lot of conversation going on about sustainable diets. Um, it's really, really important, and Andrew talked to this as well, around nutrient density. So if you just want the lowest carbon product, I mean, probably wouldn't be the most tasty. I'm, I just feel like it would be cardboard, really. Um, you know, but we, we need to have products that are actually healthy and nutritious for people. And so we can't just look at things just being low, low, low footprint because those are kind of commodity products in a lot of ways, right? Um, and they're monoculture and a whole bunch of things that aren't necessarily doing the right thing by the environment. Um, so we want to think much more holistically around our product, and nutrient density is a really, really important part of it. Um, sustainable farming, I don't have to share much more on that. But as I said, the two things that Kiwis tend to care about is water and climate. Don't ask them what any of those mean or what the problems are, um, but that's, that's what they want to know and that's what they want to hear about. So we've got to go in and dig deep with this, with this audience to try and understand what's going to be most relevant. What do we share around what we're doing um, around water um, and the climate? Um, and making sure that, yeah, we pro provide that information in an engaging, relevant way. And then the fourth is around our economic and social contribution. Um, and again, this is not about saying, 
you know, you should support our sector because, you know, we contribute X billions of dollars. Like, that's not necessarily engaging to someone. It is about the kind of people side of things in the community. So it's about finding the right way to articulate that. It is important, but it's not just kind of going out and saying things um, that make us feel better, if that makes sense. It's putting it in a way that um, engages the hearts and minds of New Zealanders. So as I mentioned, three parts to this project. We're, we're just kind of getting to the end of the planning stage, which the research will, will help us kind of finalize. Um, getting into the planning um, and all those suggestions, if you've got more suggestions around what you'd like to see and hear, um, definitely open. And then the third is getting into the implementation piece. So um, that's it for me. And if you have any other questions, I am happy to answer them. I'll, t I'll take this one here. Thank, thanks so much, Leanne. Um, so the better beef and lamb pays per nature does our job, the, the more premium we get in the overseas markets, the more we get paid, and potentially the more expensive red meat is in New Zealand, and therefore the less accessible it is to New Zealand. Is, is this a catch-22? Is this an issue? And, and maybe if I ask a side question, has, um, has milk in schools been a good PR exercise for Ontario? Um, I'll start with the second one. Um, I haven't worked for Fonterra for a number of years, but I actually worked on that program when we launched it. Um, from what I understand, it has been really, really effective. Um, milk was losing relevance. Kids weren't drinking it. They weren't. It wasn't really part of kind of their everyday life. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, most people in New Zealand, in every community, there's probably someone working in dairy. So I think it kind of, it brought a bit more of that awareness. So I think that's been quite successful for them. Um, and, you know, at the time, Teo Sperians always said, it's also the right thing to do. So um, I think, yeah, that's been quite good for them. Um, and then the first question that you had was around, um, if meat is becoming much more, red meat is becoming much more premium, does that mean that actually it becomes inaccessible to the everyday Kiwi? And how does that probably impact on maybe our social license to operate. So I think that is a really good question. Um, I don't have the short answer to that. I think it requires a bit of a discussion because I think red meat is becoming much more of a premium product just by nature because it takes a lot to produce it um, and you do want to get the most amount of money for it. Um, and it does provide amazing nutrition. So there is a lot of value in that. Um, around the everyday nutrition for everyday New Zealanders, I think um, Daniel Ebb I know is floating around and he um, he and I talk about this all the time about, and without this sounding really ideological, is you know, food is commons, this concept around, you know, it is really important that we can sell our product and get the most amount of value, but it's also important that we can feed our communities in a healthy way. And I think food is one of those few um, industries, so education, healthcare, we all think that there's a public kind of good in that and our taxes go towards that, and food is completely privatized. So. Um, I don't have the short answer to that. It's a big discussion, but I think it is an, is an interesting one to think about. Yeah. So I can just add a oh. little bit. I think. Oh, Sam. Oh, good. Sam, come on up here. <laughs> you can ask him all the hard questions. <laughs> one, of, one of the interesting things is, I, I think, is uh, the meet the need initiative. So, through that 400,000 New Zealanders last year got um, meat on their plates who would otherwise not have, um, not have got it. So, I think. I think yes, we will have to we will have to balance the, the social good along with um, running profitable businesses. This is another a bit of a personal view of mine, but I think it's backed by research. Is that um, we spend a lot of money on things that we value, right? So so if we look around the room and we think of the cell phones that are sitting in people's hands, many of you will have the latest cell phone technology, and you didn't blink an eyelid around paying a thousand dollars for it or whatever it was right so so for me um, part of what I think we need to do is we need to build uh, the perception of value uh, and meat for people and at the moment Leanne's pointed to two or three things you know climate uh, water animal welfare those things that are actually detracting from the value of meat when people come to pay a price for it they go well it's quite expensive and then I've got these doubts in my mind around how much I should be eating anyway and so that detracts from the value of it. So I'm very confident that actually over time we can we can build that value up so people um, feel like they need to purchase um, red meat. Red meat needs to be part of their of their diet and it's something they can enjoy guilt free. Yeah, I've had a couple of questions and points. Is, uh, is there much work being done to program on country of origin labelling and 
and um, also is there a potential to, to partner with um, supermarket chains to promote even if it's a financial contribution to, to promote specials on, on legs and their events and whatever it might be? Do you want to talk about the origin labeling? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I can talk about that. Um, one of one of the one of the interesting things, and we talk about um, how much people actually know about product, right? And and actually, um, people don't often know where their products comes from, so they often uh, naturally assume it's all product from New Zealand, regardless of whether it's um, imported or not. So so obviously, part of part of our branding is a sort of a country of origin. Uh, branding. It's part of why the quality mark has existed in the past. It's, it's, it's why, uh, for example, the pork industry does quite a bit of around country of origin labelling is because um, people people aren't sure or they just assume it's from here. So is that, how do we get, uh, is fed from them uh, a recommendation from the government, MPI or wherever it's going to do this? It's a, it's a, well, it's a double-edged sword because um, what you will know is we export 93% of our lamb and we export 85% of our beef, right? And and so, actually, country of origin labelling in a overseas market. And let's just take the US as a good example, right? Where where our beef, very lean beef out of New Zealand, might be blended with US or Canadian beef as part of a Big Mac that you eat. And and so. If you take a country of origin approach to that, then actually it's really um, confusing for the customer, and actually internationally it can work um, against us. So, so there are sort of two sides to the argument uh, when it's country of origin labelling, which which makes it a little difficult in our case. But for us, you know, we've got we've got to be focused on the 93% and the 85% of which we export, and make sure we have the best opportunity to extract value from that. And I'll just, and I'll come back to you in a sec, because I'll just answer your other part of your question around working with supermarkets. So um, yeah, we haven't settled on what we're actually going to do yet. So that's definitely an opportunity. I would say that's something that we've been doing overseas. So we've been partnering with meat companies such as First Light and Silverfront Farms and Ansco, um, amongst others. And we've actually been partnering in supermarkets and having really great success with that. So um, there's definitely some things that we've tried with Taste Pure Nature overseas that have been really effective that we want to make sure that we bring that thinking into New Zealand as well. Because um, it's quite what Will said, um, you can go and buy a leg of lamb for 11 bucks a kilo at times, but if you buy some leg of lamb for people, buy a leg of some special edition, it's obviously at the time the cheapest thing. As you lead up beautifully, Sam, that, can, we, can we get that image that Brandon came up? So, looking at that, three things. First of all, uh, there is our primary thing is we are beef, beef and lamb. There's no picture of a perhaps a stylized lamb and animal possibly yeah. eating that grass. Yeah. Secondly, we're putting all our living money into promoting NZ Inc. Not you, no, we're on sheep and cattle. So we should have a stylized sheep and a stylized cattle beast eating that grass, because that's the message, grass fed. The other thing is, why have such an emphasis on the wording? Because a lot of our markets, probably English is not the first language, so I feel a real thing. Most people have a recognition of a lamb, albeit they probably don't want to eat fluffy little bambi, but we need a recognition of the lamb as the animal. NZ here, you know, army, Anzac, all blacks, no, sheep, lamb, and beef. Now, I'm sure you've thought about that, but why aren't we seeing it? So this is just so you know, this is this is not the actual look. This is just well, the idea. Yeah, this is the idea. And taste for your nature, it has T P N in the middle. So I hear you, but it's usually um, see through. By the way, so you can actually see some lamb and some. Sh so it's yeah. So don't worry. This is just the concept. But I good good feedback. That's yeah, all. They're all really people to critical. Come on our marketing team, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> why the why the black? Why not a green background? Or are you saying it's clear? It's normally see-through, so you can actually see to yeah, the beautiful scenery, but don't, don't get don't caught get up on that. Up what you're seeing in front of us. The, the key it's thing just an is idea. That, <laughs> is that what we, what we saw is that actually, Taste Pure Nature, we have a brand that we've invested in internationally. The research tells us that that brand can overlay onto New Zealand pretty successfully. Uh, it ties up the relationship between domestic and international, which is becoming closer. So it's, it's sort of a no-brainer in a way, but in terms of how it's portrayed in New Zealand, it's, it's like we emphasise very different things in China with Taste Pure Nature that we do in the US, right? Because we have a different consumer who cares about different things. And so 
it's very much about tailoring um, to the people that you're trying to communicate to, which is these 23 per cent in the first instance of these New Zealanders that are this environmentally conscious neutrals that are sitting on the fence. But the Port campaign very successful, right? Didn't it have a picture of a pig on it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, we'll, we'll listen, Mark. We'll take that on board and sift through it, eh, and see whether it's helpful. <laughs> okay, I've got a question here, and then I've got one in the back. And so, to answer your question, um, you want to the whole point of the see through is to see the place where the, the pain from, of which the animals are meant to be a part of it. But if you are too close, then that's going to be actually uncomfortable because they don't necessarily want to think of having a relationship with an animal and being going to eat. They, they do want to see the place, they want to see the situation the animal's in. And so the animal has to be there, but not necessarily right up. Right. So, but yes, absolutely, the is correct. So there's a, it is meant to be a knockout. You need to see the place through the identity of which the animal will find. Oh, you mentioned um, a global narrative which um, influences the Kiwi market. And I just wondered if Food Miles is a part of that and if that has an impact on the, the 93% of the exports. So you, you didn't mention like Food Miles on that. I was here with my accent. I'm English. Food Miles is a big part of food there. So the, the whole sort of New Zealand lamb in the Waitrose right supermarket, people now have started buying Welsh lamb, British lamb. Um, so is that is that having an impact? Well, it's interesting, actually, because um, the old food miles, that's kind of the climate and the carbon um, the carbon claims. So um, it's definitely a question that comes up. As I mentioned, we're doing an update of our LCA. So uh, in terms of shipping, our, our footprint's quite low. And in New Zealand, the distances that um, have to be traveled to get to processors, et cetera, is quite low. So actually, overall, we look like we're still coming out better than locally produced lamb in the UK, for example. But that might not be something that we might want to go out and market in a huge way because of our, our trade policy. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is a bit of a balance. But it, it, that's why it's so important to do that environmental research, to be able to say, well, this is actually our footprint. And actually, we have a very low footprint kind of overall, even despite the fact that we're at the bottom of the earth over here. Yeah, thanks. Just with the um, additional value between the products that we're creating, how do we ensure that the value is consumed? Yeah. Um, from what I understand, and Sam can just jump in as well, is that um, the processing companies, the exporting companies, um, for their specific programs where they can have GMO-free claims, hormone antibiotic-free, et cetera, et cetera, um, they get a, pre a premium for those, and they are putting that premium back into farmers' pockets. So um, I can't remember the exact percentage or what have you, but um, it is there's definitely that value that's being captured for specific programs. And that's why, I um, can't remember who mentioned it, Melissa, about regenerative egg. No one's saying that that's anything that anyone might be interested in, but certain exporting companies might see an opportunity and advantage to create programs, and if they can get the premium, then again, farmers will be able to get a premium on top of it. So We've, we've done some um, analysis through our economic service over the years, and I mean, most of you will looked at, have looked at the P&Ls on most of our own companies, and you know what the relationship is between net profit and uh, turnover. Um, but what the analysis tells us is, is that for every extra dollar that they have in the marketplace, uh, paid to them, you guys get about 80 cents of it. So at the end of the day, you, you do go get most of it. Now the question is, is who gets the market beyond that, right? And, and so that's some of the things which you don't direct to customer, et cetera, et cetera, like some of the companies do. I mean, that's an attempt to capture more of that market to bring it back. I think that's all we have time for questions for, but I'll be floating around for the next couple hours. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, hopefully it was a good choice compared to the other two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much to Leanne. I think you will recognize she is a pocket rocket of positivity, and we're very lucky to have her fighting for our industry. Thank you.